Good evening, I'm Wendy Mesley, and this is The National. Days after James Comey's explosive testimony, Washington gears up for more revelations over Russia. There are some questions about Sessions that have to be asked. New details emerge from that multiple stabbing in northern Quebec. What would cause a 19-year-old to attack family? Theresa May tries to keep calm and carry on, but are her days as British Prime Minister numbered? Theresa May is a dead woman walking. Heave away, me Johnny's heave away. And on Broadway's big night, we sit down with the Canadian creators of Come From Away. Well, we didn't set out to tell a 9-11 story. We call it a 9-12 story. In the wake of the blockbuster testimony of former FBI Director James Comey, the U.S. President and his allies say he's been exonerated, that it's time to move on. Instead, Washington remains transfixed by the Russia investigation and instead of moving on, is moving on to its next witness, Donald Trump's Attorney General Jeff Sessions. Lindsay Duncombe has the story. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. From the start of his term as Attorney General, Jeff Sessions had a Russia problem. Controversial ties that are about to be scrutinized by the Senate Intelligence Committee. There are some questions about Sessions that have to be asked. We've had a lot of unnamed sources in the media come out and make statements about Jeff Sessions. It'd be very good to get it directly from him. If you've lost track of all the players in the Russia White House drama, here's the backstory on Sessions. Former senator from Alabama, one of Trump's earliest supporters, said at his confirmation hearing he didn't deal with the Russians during the campaign, forgetting to mention he met twice with Ambassador Sergei Kislyak. Back in March, Sessions recused himself from all investigations Russia and campaign related, but then appeared to sign off on firing former FBI director James Comey. Testifying last week, Comey said this about Sessions' recusal. We also were aware of facts that I can't discuss in an open setting that would make his continued engagement in a Russia-related investigation problematic. In leak-prone Washington, it didn't take long for reports to emerge that those facts were about the possibility that Sessions may have had a third previously unreported encounter with the Russian ambassador during the campaign, which the Justice Department denies. It all sets the stage for a dramatic Tuesday testimony, which may or may not be public. Spending the weekend in New Jersey, the president popped in on a wedding at his private club, something he's done for years. But judging by his Twitter, he's preoccupied with how the hearings are playing out, suggesting Comey's leaks to the press may be illegal, adding very cowardly. For some Republicans, it's too much. You're your own worst enemy here, Mr. President. Knock it off. Add this to the White House tension. There are reports the president is angry with Jeff Sessions and that the attorney general recently offered to resign. The D.C. drama isn't letting up. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Washington. In cities across the U.S., thousands have gathered for annual Pride events. But in Los Angeles, the focus wasn't just on equality and LGBT, LGBT rights. We need a president who focuses on fixing our streets, not sending us tweets. L.A. organizers turned Pride into a resist march against Donald Trump, linking up with groups from Planned Parenthood to Black Lives Matter to the ACLU. The event also drew top Democratic Party lawmakers. Dead woman walking. That's British Prime Minister Theresa May in the words of a former member of her own party. After a tepid performance in this week's election, today she's cobbling together her government while rivals on the left, right and centre sharpen their knives. Thomas Degg has more. Her husband by her side, Theresa May, headed to church. She's under assault from some within her own party. Theresa May is a dead woman walking. It's just how long she's going to remain on death row. Today, May carried out the business of a newly re-elected prime minister, meeting a steady stream of newly appointed cabinet ministers. Most are not new faces. A major cabinet reshuffle just isn't in the cards for such an embattled leader. She received at least public support from a potential rival. Jeremy Corbyn did not win this election. It's absolutely right that she should go ahead, uh, form a government.
But May's two closest advisors have already quit, and tonight at 10 Downing Street, May herself wouldn't offer any long-term assurances about her own future. I said and during the election campaign that if re-elected, I would intend to serve a full term. But what I'm doing now is actually getting on with the immediate job. One part of her job was welcoming a political ally, Donald Trump, for an upcoming visit. Today, there are reports he recently told May he won't be coming if big protests are expected. The White House denies the visit is on hold. Meanwhile, Labour Party leader Jeremy Corbyn stressed May's days are numbered. I think it's quite possible, quite possible there'll be an election later this year or early next year, and that might be a good thing because we cannot go on with a period of great instability. With its majority gone, the May government hopes to be propped up by Northern Ireland's Democratic Unionist Party. There's no formal agreement yet. There are many questions about what will happen when Parliament returns on Tuesday. It's an unusual scenario. The Labour leader who lost the election is under no pressure to leave, while the Prime Minister who won is fighting to stay. Thomas Dagler, CBC News, London. Manchester police released all 22 suspects arrested after the deadly concert bombing last month with no charges laid. Police said today some of those released offered accounts that explain innocent contact with the attacker, Salman Abedi. The investigation continues. Investigators have arrived in a remote Quebec community grappling with a horrific crime. Police shot dead a man they say stabbed five family members early yesterday morning. Three people were killed, including a child. It happened in the Inuit village of Akulavik, about 1,700 kilometers north of Montreal, on the eastern shore of Hudson Bay. The CBC's Simon Akineshny has the latest. The small village of Akulavik, population 600, yesterday woke up to a commotion. One resident looked out his window and saw 19-year-old Ilutak Anutuk. It was a bloody knife and uh, I had to hide myself. At some point, Anutuk posted to Facebook saying he stabbed five people and I just don't care if I killed someone else. Police say Anutuk broke into three houses before they shot and killed him down the block. My girlfriend went outside, she opened the door, there was a, a body, bloody body lying on the doorstep. It was Eli Kanujuak, who along with Anutuk's aunt and her son had been stabbed. Kanujuak died of his wounds. The others are recovering in a Montreal hospital. Police also say Anutuk killed his uncle and young cousin. A day after the drama, the tight-knit Inuit community is in shock and mourning. A former teacher, Randy McLeod, says Anutuk had a tragic past. His mother was murdered and his brother committed suicide. It's very unfortunate what he did, but at the same time, the lack of resources that are available to all Inuit who are taxpaying citizens in Canada, it's quite embarrassing on the part of the government. Today, Quebec Premier Philippe Couillard addressed that criticism. We know that social issues among the Inuits and First Nations in general, but Inuits in particular, are very, very significant. And we are working very, very hard to improve that. Provincial police are now trying to find out what happened to set this family tragedy in motion, a tragedy that's shaken the entire community. Simon Nakaneshny, CBC News, Montreal. Coming up... Why more than 100 people in Vancouver are being kicked out of the only home they know? And is the government rebranding Canada or just polishing the Prime Minister's own brand? During the Cold War, Canadian troops were a big part of NATO's deterrent against Russian aggression. Now, over 25 years after the collapse of the Iron Curtain, they're back on the job. The first wave of Canadian soldiers is on the ground in Latvia. Our Chris Brown is there as they settle in for the long haul. Riga's beautiful old town is packed with 800 years of history. And the newly arrived Canadians have lots to learn about their Latvian hosts. Their new home is about 45 minutes northeast of the capital on a Latvian military base. I think this place will sleep about uh, 12 or so. Sergeant Anna Mackay spent Sunday moving in. I wanted to contribute something to Canada uh, and I think that uh, this mission is worthwhile and I'm really excited to be in Latvia. 
For the moment, the 450 soldiers will be living in tents, but an advance team has been working for months to assemble equipment and to prepare for a more permanent stay. It's Lieutenant open Colonel open. Hugo de Lille has been in and, charge uh, of the and effort. And so that's giving you an idea of the size of the logistic compound and maintenance compound for Canada. And this side, that it will be used for the next couple of years. Russia's takeover of Crimea in 2014 spooked Latvia's government that they could be next, which triggered the NATO troop deployment. Most people we talked to at the central market welcomed the Canadians, though they questioned if soldiers were really needed. Many Latvians speak Russian and have close ties to the country. It's not like a minimal bias. We are part of NATO, said this man, and I don't think Russia would dare to hurt us. They don't need to invade us, he told us. His wife added, for political reasons, someone wants to make them look cruel. They aren't cruel. Russians are kind. Yeah, I would say the, um, what we'll call the conventional threat of, uh, you know, conventional ground force invasion, I would say, is not, uh, is not high. The Canadian commander here says what this mission does do is put some muscle behind NATO's words and adds credibility to the idea of deterrence. We're being entirely transparent. Our, our position here is entirely defensive and was proportionate in response to Russian actions. So the job for the Canadians now is get settled in, meet their Latvian allies and make it clear they'll defend Latvia if need be. Chris Brown, CBC News in Riga. Canada could also be sending personnel back to Afghanistan. Defence Minister Harjit Sajjan says the U.S., through NATO, has asked Ottawa to send in police trainers. Canada provides funding for security and development projects in Afghanistan, but its military mission ended three years ago. The regional blockade against Qatar is now causing a food crisis there. Iran sent planes packed with food while local producers scramble. Qatari food processing plants are working around the clock to double their output to keep up with demand. The Saudi-led embargo was imposed against Qatar last week over allegations of funding terrorism. Former Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi's second son has been freed after six years in captivity. Saif al-Islam Gaddafi was seized by rebels after his father's regime fell in 2011. They say they freed him on request from the interim government. His location is unknown. A building in Vancouver's downtown east side has become the latest flashpoint in the city's housing crisis. More than 100 residents of the Balmoral Hotel are being evicted. City officials fear the building is unsafe, but activists say there's more to the story. Fire Stewart explains. This block was more crowded and chaotic than usual today. It was part protest, part block party, because everyone here is being evicted from the Balmoral Hotel. So I'm happy to be out of here. Marcia Thomas is one of around 150 tenants being forced to move out because the Balmoral is in a dangerous state of disrepair. That's awful. That like I said, my room's full of mold. Inside, garbage, needles and mold are commonplace. The wood is rotting, which is why city officials cut off the water to the bathtubs earlier this month because of fear that the weight could cause floors to collapse. It's one of the worst in the city. But it wasn't always that way. When the hotel first opened in 1912, it was designed to attract upscale clientele. But in recent decades, it's housed some of the city's most vulnerable. People with addictions, mental problems, and those who can't afford to pay more than the $375 a month it costs to live here. Every single one of them was really clear that it is better to live in the Balmoral than to live outside. That's pretty awful. Most of the tenants have been given low-cost units in other buildings to rent, but thousands of others in the city don't have a place to live. The latest numbers show that homelessness in Metro Vancouver is up 30% over 2014. Maloon Kathari used to work for the UN and visited Vancouver in 2007 to report on the state of adequate housing. Overall, the conditions in Vancouver have worsened over the last 10 years. Why in such a wealthy city has the, has the situation been allowed to get to the way it is? 
As for the Bomoral, the city says it's consulting a prosecutor about taking the family that owns this building to court over the violations. Officials estimate there are millions of dollars in repairs that need to be done, but before that can start, the building has to be stabilized so it's safe for crews to work inside. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. Canada's Lance Stroll raced in his first Canadian Grand Prix today, and the 18-year-old finished in the top 10. Yes! Oh, finally. The rookie Formula One driver placed ninth in front of a hometown crowd. Britain's Lewis Hamilton won the race for the sixth time. Usain Bolt had an emotional farewell in Jamaica last night. A crowd of 35,000 watched the world's fastest man run his last race on home soil. Just the atmosphere and the people, the support that they came out and gave me tonight, uh, it was really nerve-wracking. The eight-time Olympic gold medalist will retire from competition in August. Next up, our Sunday talk. Tonight, we tackle Canada's brand on the world stage. You can't just sit back and play with your own little world. There are other worlds out there. Lots of them. And you can't just ignore them or brush them aside. You see, the world you know is really made up of lots of other worlds, and all of them have their own problems, which, in fact, become your problems. And worlds aren't made up simply of problems. Good things happen, exciting things and they all affect you. The thing is to understand what's happening. And to understand, you have to have a complete and comprehensive view of matters. And where to get this information? It's easy. The National News, nightly, on CBC Television. So welcome other worlds into your life. It's almost fun. The National News, Five nights a week, in the national newsroom of CBC Television, the stories come in from all parts of the world to be interpreted and prepared for use on The National. The facts are checked and the backgrounds gathered. On-the-spot reports are collected. Then the films and the tapes are evaluated and edited, readied for the air. CBC's correspondents in all corners of the world report and interpret the news. Wherever things are happening, you'll get the complete information right here on CBC Television. I'm Warren Davis. Those are just some of the things that go into the national. Join me. From here, each day at one o'clock, Canada is given the exact time. Sixty Canadian radio stations relay the signal to the nation. The CBC brings you the Dominion Observatory official time signal. The beginning of the long dash, which follows ten seconds of silence, will indicate exactly one o'clock Eastern Daylight Time. One o'clock, Eastern Daylight Time. Time now for the Sunday Talk, where we tap into the debate of the week. After a slew of policy announcements, Canada emerged with a new brand. How real is it? Justin Trudeau's bromance with Barack Obama continues with this carefully staged dinner and photo op in Montreal this week. As Trudeau gave a big thumbs up to Obama, earlier that day, his foreign affairs minister delivered a big thumbs down to Donald Trump. 
the fact that our friend and ally has come to question its mantle of global leadership puts into sharper focus the need for the rest of us to set our own clear and sovereign course. It's a rebranding of Canada. As America turns inwards, Christia Freeland says Canada must step up to tackle the big global issues. A fortress Canada approach is not going to be an approach that will maintain our prosperity. The next day, more muscle from the defense minister. If we're serious about our role in the world, we must be serious about funding our military. A promise to increase the defense budget by 70% over the next decade. Meanwhile, how does your wife feel about you uh, being uh, named the sexiest politician alive? Trudeau is working on his own brand on the Live with Kelly and Ryan show in Niagara Falls this week. I have one daughter and there is something very special about imagining a, a woman prime minister. Abroad. And with regular Canadians. That any day I can get out on the water. <laughs> very nice. Call this work. So has Canada been rebranded or is it just more branding for Justin Trudeau? I'm joined by our panelists. Lincoln Anthony Blades writes about politics for Teen Vogue and Rolling Stone. Jonathan Kay is an author and freelance columnist. And tonight we have Robin Urbach joining us. She's the editor of CBC.ca's opinion section. So, Robin, I'll come to you in just a sec, but I'm going to start with John. So we we saw the foreign affairs minister basically thumping Trump, and that evening we see uh, the prime minister dining with Obama. What's what's the message here? What's the bigger picture? What's going on? I don't think there's ba that big a deal with uh, Trudeau dining with Obama. If, if I were the prime minister and Obama were in our country, I'd, I'd have dinner with him too. I, I just think that's something people would want to do. In terms of the actual announcement about the military, I actually think it's a very clever play by the Liberal government because, don't forget, a couple of weeks ago, Trump was saying that Canada and other NATO uh, members had to pull their weight and had to pay more for their military. Uh, Canada has found a very clever way to basically do what Trump wants us to do, which is to pay a higher percentage of our GDP for military, while at the same time posturing against Trump. So I think Trudeau is going to have his cake and eat it too. He's going to make Trump happy because he's going to accede to his wishes. At the same time, he's not going to present himself to the Canadian electorate as having given in to the Americans. So I actually think it's a very clever play on Trudeau's part. Is it that clever? Is it what Canadians want, Robin? What do you think is going on? Well, I don't know. I mean, I don't see it sort of as a, a clever play as much as this liberal government kind of trying to brand itself as the opposition or the sort of honest country coming out where um, the U.S. has potentially abdicated its role on the global stage, Canada is coming forward. If you look at Krista Freeland's speech, for example, um, a, a lot of hay was made of the fact that it was sort of like a subtweet to the Americans and she sort of undermined everything that the American government was about without actually saying Trump's name. But I think that's actually really important because she's a smart cookie. If she wanted to get the Americans' attention, she would have put Trump's name in there. She didn't. It was a big subtweet, but uh, no one in the U.S. was really paying all that much attention. And the especially interesting part, I think, was that the part where she addressed the Americans directly, she said, to America, this is for you, she pivoted to French. So I actually think that the message is one that's to be interpreted for a Canadian audience rather than an American audience. I think we like to think of ourselves as sort of thumbing our nose at the Americans, but I think all of this messaging really is designed for a Canadian audience. What's your sense, like? And I mean, is this image polishing for the PM or a real rebrand? So, um, my general take on things is that sometimes more than one thing can be true at the same time. I think this is huge because there's something happening that has never happened in my life. It's never happened in your life. Never happened in anyone here's life. There is a vacancy for the leader of the free world. There is a literal vacancy. There is no one in that seat. And what you're seeing with Freeland's speech, what you're seeing with the way that uh, Trudeau is positioning himself with Obama, is that he is effectively campaigning for that job. And there's, he's not the only one. There's a couple, I'd say there's three people, who are actively campaigning for that job right now. Emmanuel Macron? Yep. A Angela Merkel? Merkel's in the lead. So if this was, if I had to rank it like it was sports, <laughs> Merkel's in the lead, 
McCrone's in second, very, very close behind, and then Trudeau would be there right third. Is Trudeau that serious, Robin? I don't think he's actually in the running. I mean, if you look at the defense spending announcement, for example, I mean, a lot of hay has been made of, okay, we're finally going to bolster our military. Canada's military, even if the defense policy announcement is fulfilled, all of the, the sort of planks along the way, and we get everything that we've been promised this past week, we're not going to have a military akin to the U.S.'s military. It's not going to happen. What this promise is, is a move to sort of remedy all of the deficiencies that have been inherent in our military and our defense forces for the past several decades. But we're not going to have that sort of autonomous uh, national defense force that uh, the Americans have. We're always going to be reliant well, on I, our I, allies. I don't, think the, I don't think it's about autonomy. I think it's just about being the leader. Right. But don't you need, if you're going to be the leader, how can you be a leader if you're saying, well, our military is kind of okay, we got some new, you know, subs and, and supply ships, but we still I'm need to bring your Jonathan help. In. Yeah. We, we saw Kelly Ripa and Emmanuel Macron, I can't believe I put them in the same question, sort of making googly eyes at, at the Prime Minister. Uh, are we, as Lincoln is suggesting, sort of number three on the, on the global power list? Uh, <laughs> look, uh, there was a, a great British historian who came to Toronto a few months ago, a, a Timothy Garton Ash, and he gave a speech, and this was right after Brexit, this was, actually, this was also after Trump's election, and he said to the crowd, Canadian crowd, he said, there are two great leaders now standing up for traditional liberal Western values, and one is Angela Merkel, who has a tougher job because of uh, the, the mass migration that's taking place in Europe, and the other is Justin Trudeau. And the audience, you can hear them kind of gasp because we don't think of our leaders in those terms. But it is true, now we have a third Macron, uh, that, that these are the primary planks that are protecting traditional Western values because, and it's not so much that Canada and France uh, and Germany have changed, it's that so many other nations have abandoned those values. So we are leading, I would say, essentially by holding on to the values that maybe 10 years ago all Western countries believed. But Robin, you've written about, you know, we saw all of those pictures of him on the TV shows and in the kayak and right. so on, that a lot of it is quite staged. Is it real? I think, you know, to a certain extent, every selfie that we see or the kayaks or the decision to have Krista Freeland go out there and kind of thumb her nose at the Americans, this, these are all calculated decisions. So nothing's happen, happening spontaneously. And I think the message that... Canadians are supposed to get from this is that if the U.S. is sort of stepping aside and Trump is pulling in this new sort of isolationist policy. But even like that photobomb you wrote about that right. that picture of the prime minister jogging behind people on the seawall that 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 it was fake. Well, I mean, the encounter might have been real, but the messaging, the way that we are absorbing it, is very calculated. These are decisions. I mean, we saw it right from the beginning after Trudeau was elected in 2015. He got on the subway the next morning and he went on the metro and he was talking with people in Montreal and the message was very clear there. It wasn't an accident. It was, I'm going to be your prime minister and I'm going to be a very different prime minister. So and is that bogus, then, Lincoln, or is, it, or is it smart? Well, it's, uh, the thing that we should be talking about is the impact. And I think that this is where the conversation is, uh, is going to eventually shift to when it comes to politics, especially with what we've seen in the UK. The new thing that we should be looking at is the impact that it has on youth voters. Is it galvanizing people? Is it polarizing people? What effect is it having on the youth voters? Because the youth voters are going to be the ones who are going to make sure that they determine who's going to be in office and who gets out of office. And, and we're they, going to see that. they like those things. They don't see them as dumb. Like but see, here's the thing. So older I, people roll their eyes when they see those. Yeah, so I write mostly in the, in the United States, right? And when I'm writing for people in the United States, they're not necessarily as savvy about maybe the how staged things are, right? So when you, when you see, oh, you know, the meme I saw was, here's uh, Trudeau, and he, this is what they do in Canada. And you see him, and he, you know, paddles up, and th th there's no higher thinking beyond that. There's no, like, you know, was that staged? Do you think that he maybe got actors? Like, they, like they're just like, that's cool. Our guy doesn't do that, and that's sort of how they look at it. Robin's jaded attitude, I think, <laughs> is just all too Canadian, is that for decades we're tired of being ignored on the world stage, and then finally we get somebody... Uh, who's who's hot internationally, and we just let the, we we turn around and say, "Oh my God, this thing has been staged." And, and the I word say, "hot" is key. Sorry? The word "hot," the word "hot" well, that he used is very key. But I, I think it's important. I mean, uh, it's, it's not mutually <laughs> exclusive when you have substance and flash. Uh, uh, last week, NPR uh, they did this great interview with a bunch of voters. They were in a pub in England, uh, and they did not vote in in the, the British election. And the reporter said, why didn't you vote? And, and the guy said, he said, we have no one who inspires us 
uh, no one who inspires young people like Macron and Trudeau. And I said, that's, that's amazing. And what he meant by inspirational wasn't just the policy. It was the fact that as somebody with flash and vigor who actually got people excited about politics. And yet in the UK yeah. election, we saw they were talking about the youth quake. Right. Yeah. I mean, we didn't expect in the UK that youth would come out to the degree that they did. And that's sort of... Wait, who's we? All right. Us jaded folks. But imagine didn't Corbyn with Trudeau's photo appeal then you'd probably have a Labour majority. But I think yeah. young people are smarter than that, though. I mean, we see Trudeau... I don't think so. Oh, I think they're less enough. smart than I that. mean, we but see his socks and we think they look lovely, but a lot of people, I mean, a lot of young Canadians are very upset, for example, that the Liberals haven't decriminalized marijuana before legalizing it, or that Trudeau abandoned his electoral reform promise. So, yes, I mean, it's, it's nice that he's inspiring and he takes great selfies and his hair is fantastic or whatever, but there are bigger issues. And okay. I think, but I, last I would, point to you, Lincoln, and then uh, to John. I would say that the meme that you hear the kids use on social media, the kids are using, yeah. is get you a man that can do both, yeah. right? So it's all about authenticity on both sides. We are not shallow. And when I, I've said this about last uh, year's election. When Hillary Clinton went to dance with Ellen because she thought that was going to get young black millennials to think she's cool because she can do the Dougie or whatever, that didn't work out. Yeah. So when you look at what Justin Trudeau is doing, this seems authentic, even if it's not authentic. Last but his policies point, John, are also good, too. I, I think it's important that, as, as well as the optics, we also have substance. And at the end of the day, you have... You have Trump and the Americans who are obsessed with the idea of Canada and other Western allies being parasites. I think we've anteed up. We're not parasites. We're giving more to defense. So he's putting substance behind the flash. Thanks so much to all of you. Very interesting. A U.S. territory is also deciding whether to rebrand. Will Puerto Ricans remain in the States or bid adios to America? And people want to, you know, bridge these differences, uh, regardless of race or religion or where you're from. The makers have come from away on why their show is striking the right chord. That's all coming up on The National.
Tonight is a big night for theater. The Tony Awards are widely considered the Oscars of the stage, and Canada's Come From Away is nominated for seven of them, including the biggest honor on Broadway, Best Musical. Whatever happens tonight, it's been quite a ride, and just as compelling as the show itself are its creators. Irene Sankoff and David Hine are the Canadians who brought Come From Away to life. Our conversation in a moment, but first, some background. It's hard to get more Canadian than this. A kiss and a card and whatever's in between. A scene from the Tim Hortons in Gander, Newfoundland, a town of 9,000, as the residents take in almost 7,000 stranded passengers from 38 planes that were diverted because of 9-11. Tonight we honor what was last, but we also commemorate what we found. It's the musical brainchild of Irene Sankoff and David Hine. The couple visited Gander on the 10th anniversary of 9-11. After connecting with the community, they knew this was a story that needed to be told. Heave away, me jollies, heave away. Irene and David mounted productions in San Diego, Seattle, and D.C. before a sold-out run in Toronto. Where our story starts, it's my first day at the station. Gander got a show too. I'm sure that everybody that sees this will have a good feeling in the bottom of their gut. My gut is sore from laughing and crying. Then, the big time. Broadway. One of just five Canadian musicals to ever make it there. The nominees for Best Musical are Come From Away. Soon after, the Tony nominations started pouring in. And now, Come From Away is gearing up for a major North American tour, maybe even the West End in London. I met up with David and Irene earlier, after the show, in New York's Theatre District. For so long, uh, people in the arts and television and movies and so on were really careful. There was almost a taboo about telling 9-11 stories. But through Gander, through this story, it, it, it's like it's, why is it different? Well, we didn't set out to tell a 9-11 story. I mean, we fell in love with Newfoundland. We wanted to tell the story uh, not about what happened here in New York, but about how they responded, about how these people responded to a tragedy and how we can all respond to a tragedy through kindness. So we call it a 9-12 story. This is, this is uh, how, how they responded, but also uh, the show can be in response to any tragedy to some degree if, if people are grounded somewhere. And, and that's what I hope the show does, is that, is that we don't have to wait for a tragedy to, to bring out this kindness. And, and there comes a time when I think through art you can sort of look back and examine and, it, and feel both sides, you know, both the, both the pain and the suffering and, you know, and, and the joy that, you know, the human spirit just tries to, you know, I yeah. think that as a species that's what we do or we won't survive. Well, it is quite the story in this age where you've got walls going up and you've got the president talking about, yeah. you know, banning immigrants and then you've got Newfoundland welcoming them. them. So it's, it's a particular message in a particular time. We had yeah. this amazing experience out in Washington, D.C. of having this bipartisan audience uh, from both sides of the aisle coming together to celebrate this story about human kindness and about coming together. And it feels like time and again we've seen that, you know, people want this, people want to, you know, bridge these differences uh, regardless of race or religion or where you're from. People are looking for that and, um, you know, regardless of politics, uh, it, it feels like the story is good to tell right now. It's been good for us. So our Prime Minister and Donald Trump's daughter went to see your show. What, what was that like? Did you get a phone call saying uh, <laughs> they want to go? Like, how did that go down? We, uh, we did get a phone call uh, telling us that it was going to happen, and, and there's a whole preparation of the theater. And, and uh, he was so lovely afterwards. He thanked the stage management crew and the crew for... For, uh, for letting them invade, really, you yeah. know, for disrupting, um, you know, what, what the usual rhythm is. Yeah. And we found out right before the show, uh, we said, so So they're coming, and they said, yes, and your job is to introduce him to the entire band, the entire crew, all of the Newfoundlanders, all of the Come From Aways <laughs> who were here that night, and we were like, oh, we're going to hang out with them on stage. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, and it was amazing. I mean, what was amazing about it was um, uh, that night and opening night, 
we had the, the people who had inspired the characters and we brought them out on stage. Mm -hmm. And to see the Prime Minister of Canada uh, speak to each one of them and, uh, and talk, uh, talk to them about their experience. I mean, all, all of the Newfoundlanders will say, uh, you know, it's, what they did was just ordinary. It's just what anyone would have done. But to have it recognized by the head of your country and to have it recognized by this New York audience giving them a standing ovation and cheering for them, it's really wonderful to see them, you know, realize that it, it's extraordinary. It's really amazing what they did. Being there for each other in times of difficulty is something that Newfoundlanders get, and it's certainly something that uh, that Canadians and Americans get. Ivanka was there too. Yes. Yeah. Did you want her like to pass on messages to Dad, or we <laughs> hoped that she would be moved by the story, and you know, I I very tried to very professionally sit throughout the entire show and not look behind me, and then at the very end, I just couldn't help myself, and I turned around and I looked at her, and I I saw her just as she was clapping, and she turned to Nikki Haley, and she said, you know, that was really really great. I guess it makes me think of when uh, the vice president arrived for the showing of Hamilton and got booed. We truly hope that this show has inspired you to uphold our American values and to work on behalf of all of us. Like, have you had to tell your cast what to do if, like, if you were to show up? Like, what would you do? We never wanted to tell anyone what to do, but I think there's just been a general understanding that, uh, you know, because we, we, we've talked about it. We've talked about what would we want to say, and I think what we want to say is look at what how it happened in Newfoundland. Look mm -hmm. at this time when. Uh, around the world, we were all refugees being brought off planes. City, Gander, Gander, all. And you know, we talk so much about how um, the Newfoundlanders were kind and they were generous, but we, we don't talk enough about how they were smart and they were courageous. This was after 9/11. People were really scared. These were strangers on the planes. They had and no idea what to expect off those planes. They yeah. really didn't. Yeah. And they had every right to keep them on the planes or to keep them at the airport and to say these but people look, they are... they didn't have to land them at all, you know yeah. what I mean? I mean, it never crossed their mind, I don't think, but, you know, they, they said, you know, this is going to be hard to do, like... I think one of the guys at the air traffic control tower said, you know, if he said to me half an hour before it happened, can you land this many planes in this amount of time, he would have said no. Yeah. You know, and, the, and yet they did it. But instead of 7,000 scared and angry people angry. with, with, with no information yeah. uh, being bottled up, they brought them into their homes, they gave them everything, and instead of you know 7,000 enemies, they made 7,000 friends. And I think there's something really valuable about remembering that and, and seeing that as a, a valuable strategy uh, to reaching out across our divides and, and saying, I don't know you, but, uh, but I'm going to welcome you into my home. There were people in the crowd who were going, wow. I never knew that story, or I probably never thought of Newfoundland. And it's a pretty, it's, it's a pretty wonderful story. It's a pretty wonderful place for people to know about. Do you think, like, are people going to go there? We see the ads in Canada. Yeah. They're talking about it. They're talking about. Uh, they're they're doing a lot of tourism planning right now. And, and really? we and we were tourists on the basis going of out your there. show. On the basis of the show, they're yeah, having come from yeah. away tours out there, and uh, and there's a special package where you get to have dinner with the mayor of Gander and. Uh, I'd, li I'd, I'd take that package, he's amazing. And we were tourists at the time, when we went out there on the 10th mm -hmm. anniversary, mm -hmm. we were come from ways. It was so good for us to be there, and I can't wait to go back. Well, what was it like to put it on in Gander? You know, people in the cast say <laughs> there are words in the English language <laughs> that have been invented, yeah. It was such an unbelievable experience. I mean, and apparently the cast is backstage and they're all just being like, we're not going to cry. No one's going to cry. No one's going to lose it, We're right? just going to do the show. And they got out there and they started singing I'm an Islander. And the crowd started screaming and cheering and they stood up and all of them went, oh, <laughs> they all, we all started like we just, we were messes. and. And then in the middle of it, um, uh, we've got this traditional song, Heave Away, from the dock. Heave away. Me heave away. Uh, where everyone else thinks this is a nice Newfoundland song that we clearly wrote. Um, but in Newfoundland, you, you know, the cast thinks, da -da 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 da 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 and 5,000 people went, Heave Away! And we all went, <laughs> it was incredible. And then 10 minutes before the show ended, they all stood up. They stood up and, and, and gave us a standing ovation while the show was finishing. I mean, it was a once-in-a-lifetime experience already, just getting to say to your cast, this is where it was inspired, this is where we were inspired, these are the people who inspired us, you know, this is, 
this is Oz Fudge who drives his police cruiser and you can drive you get to drive it and and this is Bonnie Harris who runs the SPCA and you get to cuddle the same kittens like that's that's incredible enough but then to share this thing that we created based on their stories to reflect their culture and say this is amazing we want to celebrate you and and I, I think Newfoundlanders aren't used to being celebrated and it was really it was really good Thanks so much. My yeah, pleasure. it was fun to talk to you guys. Me too. <laughs> if you enjoyed our interview with the co-creators of Come From Away, we've got all kinds of great conversations and more on our YouTube channel. Just go to youtube.com slash cbcthenational. You can subscribe and let us know what you think. When we come back, is the United States about to gain a new state? We'll tell you about a referendum. In the laboratory, film shot during the morning is now being processed. Several miles of film pass through these machines every week. Final conference with the producer, the assignment editor, and the man who physically puts the program together, the lineup editor. They discuss items that are available, items that failed, and stories they hope will still be realized before airtime. Pressure also begins to build on the film editors who are called upon to handle several types of film and sound systems. This particular one is known as double system, where the film image is on one strip of 16 millimeter film and the sound is on a separate strip of recording tape of the same width. The two must be kept in perfect synchronization at all times, a task which demands intense concentration. Color film, above all, requires special care and is always handled with soft cotton gloves. The slightest speck of dirt can cause a scratch visible along the length of the film. The film you see here is being edited for this particular program. In addition to all his other duties, the lineup editor has to screen each film as it arrives, evaluate it, and decide on its edited length. Sounds quite better. Yeah. Seems to be good. A simpler film editing process and slightly faster to handle is single system, with the soundtrack already recorded on a narrow strip of tape along one edge. Although less versatile for editing purposes, it is more easily handled, and at this moment in the day, every minute counts. Brendan, what time do you expect O'Brien's film? The lineup editor's title explains his job. He literally lines up the film and decides in which order the various films will run during the newscast. Naturally, this list is subject to frequent change as a developing story assumes greater importance or another item fails to materialize. His biggest problems are time and people. People who arrive late, people who arrive early, people who don't arrive at all. Goodbye returns to CBC for a dramatic third season. Will you be saying hello or goodbye to someone at Pearson International Airport? Get in touch with us and share your story today.
Puerto Rico wants to become America's 51st state. Today, the U.S. territory voted overwhelmingly that way in a referendum. The result isn't binding, but it's an indication of just how dire the economic situation there is. Stephen D'Souza now with a look at the issues that drove Puerto Ricans to the polls. On the streets of Puerto Rico, there is frustration, anger, and fear as the American territory heads into uncharted waters. Right now, we don't have like a clear path of where we're going, what is going to happen the next day. We're living day by day in the island. Jeanette Garcia Alonso is a Puerto Rican activist who's come to New York to speak out for an island she says is often ignored by Americans. In this courthouse in San Juan, the largest ever government bankruptcy in U.S. history will play out over months, possibly years. The territory's future is now in the hands of a Congress-appointed oversight board and judge. Puerto Rico has been in recession since 2006. Previous governments made it worse by borrowing to pay the bills. Puerto Rico is now $123 billion in debt, owing a multitude of creditors from hedge fund managers to small investors. The situation has already forced the government to shut down some schools and freeze salaries. On Puerto Rican community stay side. The Puerto Rican diaspora in America is watching anxiously. At this conference in New York, some like Garcia Alonso worry the court will favor American banks over Puerto Rican citizens. This judge that is appointed to Puerto Rico is a judge from New York um, who might, you know, represent what Wall Street and the interests of the capital. In the past, Puerto Rico, like U.S. states, could not seek bankruptcy protection. But the Obama administration, fearing a humanitarian crisis, passed a law last year called PROMESA. Experts say it gives Puerto Rico new powers to restructure its debt and requires that all creditors are treated equally. The reality is, is things are still going to be very hard for the people of Puerto Rico, but it's very likely they're going to get the debt relief they need and it's going to be an unprecedented amount of debt relief. Many here worry that means austerity measures like lost government pensions and the disappearance of funding for basic services and infrastructure projects. With the poverty rate already at 45 percent, they're concerned about the human cost of the crisis. There's also a looming health care crisis. Money for government-funded Medicaid could run out in mere months. It's estimated 10 percent of Puerto Rico's population has left the island in the last decade. And Puerto Ricans here say Without more help from Congress, that exodus will only get worse, further adding to the island's problems. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, New York. Coming up, we'll take a look back at the real story that inspired the multiple Tony-nominated Come From Away. The people in this town should be blessed forever. When Gander Newfoundland took center stage, that's next on The National. Suicide is a huge problem here in this town. We lost so many friends. My best friend, Johnny, committed suicide. During his funeral at the church, I didn't cry. Not until he was getting put down six feet down for the last time I was going to see him. my heart into a million pieces. I was like, I don't know I I Thank you for supporting the annual dance competition. Hey,
Comitanza di forze, siamo sempre noi a decidere chi siamo, 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 chi siam